<clears throat> Hi, everybody. We'll make a start. I think I know most people in the room. I'm Eileen Scanlon. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome you to another in the series of uh, learning, teaching, innovation sponsored seminars. We've had, uh, usually it's Martin Weller who welcomes you to these events, but sadly for us, but not for him, he's in California and we are in Milton Keynes. So there you go. Um, there's a, a really interesting set of talks that we, we had um, arranged and sponsored by the then PVC, Hazel Reimer. Um, what we have today is a, a, a complete expert in Denise Whitelock. She's going to talk about digital assessment. Denise has a fantastic reputation, both internally and externally, for her work. She, particularly in the area of assessment, she's had multiple large external research grants working with uh, people across Europe on these concepts. Uh, but probably as important for these purposes, Denise is someone who believes that your research and your teaching are completely synergistic. So in her time with us in the Open University, she has chaired modules, she has designed assessment, she has worked with colleagues to develop assessment policy. And in her current role, um, she has a particular uh, responsibility for um, quality monitoring and enhancement. And I think we all know that assessment is kind of the key thing that we do to and with our students. So we are in very safe hands in this talk and I'm delighted to welcome Denise to the stage. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to see you all here today. And um, this talk, I'm going to talk about digital assessment, but I've reflected on um, how to present some of my own work and the work of others. And to think at this particular time, who's actually driving the digital assessment agenda? And who's other stakeholders, so who's got the crystal ball? So I'm going to talk about students' roles, teachers, researchers, awarding bodies, and disruptors. But first of all, let's start with students. I mean, Derek Rowntree wrote the salient work on assessment. He was one of the first professors in IET a long time ago now. And he, he says very clearly, assessment drives learning. And we do all sorts of things to ease the burden with our students. We're very conscious of them. But let's have a look at some of the findings from Chris McKillop's doctoral thesis. Now, she set up a programme where people were supposed to write narratives about how they felt and how they experienced assessment. And she found it very difficult to get much data. But when she asked them to draw their experiences, here we see real life at the bottom and careful of the steps going up. But this is an even more traumatic picture that was drawn. <laughs> So perhaps we need to think more carefully about the students and how they actually feel about the assessment. And of course, there are all sorts of tensions for us as teachers producing courses because, you know, we have got our constructivist learning push. We have our ideas about how people should be assessed and different forms of assessment. But of course, the tension is always there from the awarding body, whoever they might be, about institutional reliability and accountability. So we're always within that milieu when we are trying to move things forward. And of course, one of the grand challenges 
is representing our analysis of learning that can be readily understood by the awarding bodies, by ourselves in moving things forwards for our students. But how we represent that to our students is something else that we're trying to move forward in the learning analytics and showing students uh, what we know and how it might help them move forward. So let's look at a real problem that was being experienced in Kent. And this piece of software was developed by Ali Fowler. It's quite a long time ago, so it's in LISC. But they had a problem. They were teaching Spanish, and they had 300 students to one tutor. And so anyone who knows about teaching languages or even learning languages, that you know, if you make a mistake and it's not corrected quickly enough, the error becomes fossilized. And so they thought, can we use some technology here to help us? So what they did, they built a system, and there were two attempts by the students to actually do the translation into Spanish. And so this raised the issue of, if we have two attempts, how do we weight the uh, response? And they found the best way was to have these responses unequally weighted because they piloted this. So this is a generic finding for us who are giving feedback with automatic uh, systems, that the best way was to give the first attempt, to give more weight to the first attempt, because if you don't, then students don't actually try enough because they know they've got this, they'll get some feedback and on the second attempt it'll be a lot easier. So the more information given in the feedback would lower the weight the second mark should carry. So that's good genetic advice, uh, sorry, generic advice, not genetic advice, for us who are using these types of systems. But what's interesting here, the teachers were in control because they had sourced the problem and were crystal ball gazing and then trying to find a technological solution. But what about the students? I mentioned in the beginning, I showed you those diagrams, those pictures, that we need to support and students with their anxiety to alleviate that and you know, to provide good feedback so that they can actually change and move forward in their assignments and help them to do them. Now, what influenced me with that particular problem was the work of Carol Dweck. And what this is about is the notion of praising effort. So, Carol's been working in the area for a long time, and she, her doctoral student, Muller, did this work in the US with thousands and thousands of students. And that praise for ability, just for ability and getting things right, they found can hinder learning because praise was turning out to be being clever and people were being reinforced as being clever and negative feedback was saying you're without ability and this is disempowering and demoralizing. And so what they did was they went into the US, into loads and loads of schools. They gave the children uh, Raven's matrices tests. Those are non-verbal reasoning tasks. Anybody who can remember the 11 plus <laughs> will know that they had to do that in the 11 plus. And what they did was they gave the first test, the pupils were given praise either for effort or ability. So it was a randomized control trial. They gave them another Raven's test, it was more difficult. And then in the third test, which was medium difficulty, they found the score was up one point for pupils praised for effort and down one point for ability. Very interesting, statistically significant with thousands and thousands 
of uh, students. So what does this mean? And how do people react? So if we look at the work in the area, you can come away with feedback that is very negative and you can believe that your intelligence is something very basic and you can't change it very much. You can learn new things, but you can't really change how intelligent you are. But there's another way of looking, at, and also not, no matter how much intelligence you have, you can always change it quite a bit if you're getting different types of feedback about yourself, and you can always change your intelligence. And with our students, we see this, and we can see it with ourselves. You know, you can change. And so Dweck actually talks about this. And she talks about fixed mindset people and growth mindsets. And fixed mindset people can be super sensitive about being wrong, always trying to prove themselves. And they're often people who have been immensely, immensely clever and passed all the exams without too much effort. But growth mindset people stretch themselves. They see, you know, challenges, not obstacles. And there's this lack of tension when they're learning. So I took all this on board and I was asked to build something for the arts faculty because they, uh, we were very concerned at the OU at the time that multiple guess, sorry, multiple choice, <laughs> doesn't work terribly well for art students. So I was working with a historian and we built open uh, comment and what we did I took on board um, Dweck's work in the feedback which I'll explain but to build the system we had to um, work with some areas of history that had causality so we could deal with numbers about how people changed their occupation when they moved from agriculture into the cities, and we could look at numbers and look at things like that. We could look at reasons for the First World War where there was causality. So in order to build this up, I acted with um, others to become a student. So I started to do the essays, and to my chagrin, I could only get a C grade, and I was quite peeved by getting a C grade. And then I got hold of the academic and said, well, what's wrong with this? Why am I not getting an A grade? And what I found out was the rules of the game. And this is what our students don't know when they change disciplines. What happened was, if you are a historian, what you do is, and because I'm a scientist by trade, I'm going to talk about variables. So what they do is, when there's, a, when there's an answer or something you're investigating in history, you look at the variables, the reasons. And then to get the good marks, what you do is you weight those variables. And we do that in science, we weight variables. So, they, so you weight the argument, and then you can get the A grade. So I thought, well, goodness, this is something surely we should be telling the students. They should start to understand the rules of the game. So here we've got a question about the First World War. And I wrote in to the system, it says, you know, read the first paragraph, what are the reasons, and I put no idea. So the feedback comes, maybe you're a bit confused by the question. It may be helpful to remember that you're not being asked about the causes directly but why the causes have been so extensively studied. But I'm going to show you now what's underneath the bonnet and how Dweck's work influenced the, the changes and the feedback to recognise effort. So what did, can the, the system do, first of all? What it did was detect errors. First thing you're going to do when you look at an answer is detect the errors. So we're going to give sorts of feedback that recognise effort and encourage the student to have another go. 
So you've done well to start answering this question, but perhaps you misunderstood it. Instead of thinking about X, consider Y. Next stage. So is there a direct error? So there could be a date wrong or something. Look for the first omission, what's been left out. So praise what's correct, point out what's missing, and recognize what has been correct and the effort used. Second stage, look for the second error, omission rather. Then the final stage is, because what we do when we're often on essays, particularly, we request clarification. So what we're trying to do is understand, get more detail about the point raised. And then further analysis. But more importantly for history is request the inference from the analysis of the key point. And then finally, check the causality. But more importantly, check the weighting of those variables so that you are actually inducting the student into what I'm calling rules of the game and really recognising effort. And what about the emotional support we give to our students when we give them feedback? It's very difficult at times to receive written feedback. We all know that. And in fact, I think my first doctoral student had put in her work to be published in a journal and didn't show me the feedback for three months. She was so ashamed of it. And then when I looked at it, there was, it was nothing. It, was, it wasn't bad at all. But when you don't know and you haven't experienced it, it becomes problematic. So it's not just a cognitive response. There is an emotional response when you receive feedback. So how can Bales help with that? So how can we help teachers to give feedback with emotional support? Now, Bales was a psychologist in the 50s. He worked for, I think, about over 20 years to refine his categories, his interactional categories. And what I did was adopt his categories, the four main categories. And the reason I wanted to use those to think about looking at how we give feedback was that they have positive and negative responses. And when we all work together and train with the ALs, we know that we're not trying to give too much negative um, response. So we'd want to check for it to make sure it wasn't there. We want to see positive responses. But we also want to look at how the tutor is helping the student, giving suggestions, giving opinions, giving information, and also asking questions. So what we did is we looked at uh, responses from different cohorts, tutor-marked assignments, and we looked at the mark awarded and the uh, category of response. And if you look at the A's, and A is, uh, you know, praise, pass one is the highest pass, so you've got more praise in pass one and two for the mark awarded. Easier to give praise, but there is praise there in the lower marks. But more importantly, let's look at Bs, the category B, which are really the teaching comments. If you think about it, if somebody's done very well, you won't have to give them as many teaching comments. So B past one, the line isn't so long. But if you move up to B past four, B past three, there's far more teaching comments here because you're trying to help the student move forward. C is questioning. And I thought that there would be more questioning for pass one because you'd be pushing the student to do better. But actually, the questioning is more 
in past four. Now, why is that? I was quite puzzled. But if you think about it, English is a very polite language. Our non-native speakers, you know, sometimes get very cross with the feedback we give them. They say, why don't you be a bit more direct? Because we say things like, have you thought about adding X here? Which actually means you should have put X in this part. So that's why that's reversed. And you can see that there's, there isn't a lot of negativity. There might be no, that isn't correct or something sometimes. But as we would expect, we wouldn't want lots of negativity. So here's a program built on those findings, research findings, called Open Mentor. And what Open Mentor does, it takes the mark awarded and strips out all the teacher comments and categorizes them in those categories and is able to uh, give some advice. So you can see all the, um, you know, if you're a tutor, you can go in, put it in. You can see all the sorts of comments and how they've been categorized. But this is important. This here, because we've got an algorithm underneath, this here shows you that there is, as we've analysed thousands and thousands of these, that really there is an ideal sort of number that you should use for the mark awarded. But what it's really saying is, if your student has a low mark, you need to support them with good teaching comments. There should be some praise there, but we don't want too much negativity. And we've used this in training here at the OU, but more importantly, Kings have taken it. We had JISC money to transfer. Kings and Southampton. So trying to help tutors to give feedback that will support the student, and also when we gave the um, training, we were also thinking about effort. Now, how do we help uh, students write their TMAs and essays? And this project arose from when I read Simpson Orman's work, and Orman said, 38% of our students do not give in their first TMA. And we know we can't support students to practice their first TMA. So what if we had a program that could help them? They could put something in and they could get some feedback back on their first draft. And what sort of theory could I draw upon to um, help build the system? So what I thought about was PASC. And I'd worked, done some work. Uh, I'd, my first research for my thesis used some of Pask's ideas. And Pask is about conversational theory. And so if I don't understand something and I'm in a meeting or I'm with people, um, sometimes I will say, uh, say it back to them to check that I've understood. So what if a system could say back to you what you've written down. And in computer terms, that would be create a summary. So what if it summarized what you said and then you could check, oh, is that what I meant to say or not say? So what I did is I went to find somebody who was an expert in summarization. And they happened to be in Oxford. And we put the EPSRC uh, bid together and we came up with this project, SACE, where we built Open Essayist, and which presents summaries of students' work. And it helps you to write. And Stephen is here, Stephen Foster, who's working with Open Essayist at the moment. So if you want to know more about it and become involved in some trials, I'm sure he'd love to talk to you. And Really what it does is it looks at the structure of the essay. 
It can summarize, it picks out key words and key phrases and key sentences and to give overall meaning, to represent the overall meaning. And the program looks something like this. It will divide your essay, your thousand words or your draft. And there are hints there to help you understand the different parts of feedback that's available to you. And it has this dispersion plot. Now, what's really good here is that underneath all this, they said to me, well, what, what, what is an essay? What is it you're trying to do here? And an essay, a good essay, has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And in the beginning, you tell the people what you're going to tell them. In the middle, you bring the evidence about what you're going to tell them. And then in the final part, the end, you tell them what all that inference meant. But also, it should link up to the beginning about what you said you were going to say. So in this dispersion plot, in the, on the left-hand side, I'm sorry it's not so clear, it's about the introduction. At the end, it's about what's in the, the conclusion. And so you should be picking up in the middle the evidence for things you said you were going to say about, and then you should be picking them up at the end. So you've got a visual representation. You know, have you got a coherent narrative? Now, we tried this with... H817, which I chaired, and we've got some positive correlations. And what was interesting was that the mean grade, overall grade for the module for that year with students who used it was better, statistically significant better, than the cohort before. And, of course, it made a difference of how many times you use the system if you used it more than once, you are probably going to get a better grade. But there was a new feature that we put in that we couldn't test, and Stephen is testing, is what we're calling the rainbow diagrams. I find this very exciting. Let me tell you a story about it. So in this, this is just to illustrate how the rainbow diagrams work. When it's, uh, it's, the rainbow diagram is a representation of the work you've produced in the essay. So here's a short text, which the researcher put together, but it's, it's a rather unfortunate because he talks about foxes killed by dogs. However, look at the colours, and this is the extract. Okay, So when the system gets hold of it, it produces a number of dots, spheres, of different colours. And the second sentence you can see there, the node is violet, and then the last sentence, the node is red. And the colours make a big difference. That's why they're called rainbow. So the researcher who did this in the project was not a physicist, so didn't think about the colours of the rainbow. Richard of York gave battle in vain. Do you remember learning all that in physics? So she got it round the wrong way. So the conclusions are red, and the introduction stuff is violent. So you'll see in the next diagram. Here's an essay with 10 identical paragraphs. So the, here we've got a pattern of 10 identical paragraphs. Here are 50 identical sentences with the spheres. Not very coherent, not close together. Look at the Stanford University Booth Prize essay. Everything is close and tight. The conclusion, the introduction, so the violet and red nodes close together, the other nodes, the evidence coming in, all forming a coherent narrative. Now, here's one of our essays we put in that had a high grade. Obviously, it's not a Stanford Booth essay. You wouldn't expect it to be. But look, we've got red and violet coming together and that we can see a close relationship. Here's the low grade. Not coherent. Not all forming together. And what we did is we looked at 
how the rainbow diagrams might be related to the mark awarded. And we um, had the marks of some essays, we put them through the system, and we looked at them um, by hand to see as well how they worked. But we found essays rated as high would be expected to receive 8.5 percentage points more than essays rated as medium. So from the diagrams, we then went to the marks and we could tell by eye, you know, we said, are these high, medium or low? Then we checked and we found that this is a way of predicting a, a mark. So helping students, giving them feedback when they are on their own, they don't have any other help and they might want to be trialing things without asking the tutor at this moment in time, supporting them. But as we all know, when we start, we don't know what we don't know. So if we've got technology to support people on their way, my hypothesis is maybe the tutors will get more questions, more <coughs> pet salient, pertinent questions that students feel confident to ask because they understand a bit better and something that the machine can't give them. Now here's the, the crystal ball with awarding bodies, really. If we're moving to more e-assessment, and we are, uh, other universities are becoming distance educators, looking to technology to assist them. How can we be sure that the people who sit our exams and tests that we're going to give degrees to are actually the people we are awarding? So the aim of this project was really looking at secure and reliable online assessment. And this was the Tesla project, a European project. Um, Wayne is in the room, he's worked on this project. Ali is in the room, worked on this project. Chris unfortunately can't be with us because he's in Barcelona giving a talk about what we did here in the OU, our contribution to this project. So the technologies that were available consisted of biometric data as well, voice and face recognition, keystroke pattern detection as well, anti-plagiarism, and forensic analysis. That particular piece of software came from Mexico, and it was software that was being used by the police to try and uh, find people <laughs> from what they've been writing. So we've got 18 European partners. You say to me, gosh, that's a lot of people to work with, and it certainly was. But what was important, I think, and we were very much involved here, was the testing of the system live across different countries. So we had Turkey involved, um, Uvascular in Finland, the Netherlands, the Open University, ourselves, um, Sofia University, and the Technical University in Sofia, and um, UOC in Barcelona. So the total number of students who took part in the trials we've got here are 11,000. But not all completed the pre-questionnaires and the post-questionnaires, but uh, 3,000, 3,500 completed pre-questionnaires, and we've got 20% uh, completing the um, post-questionnaires to give us advice about how things were working. So the OU did very well with it, engaging students to take part. And this is important here because we could not put the software into you know, a course. So it was a normal part of the course. Whereas UOC had integrated it. But we did get students involved and I think this is something that we need to think about as a university, how we get student testers 
to look at new bits of software and to move things forward. What was really interesting, I think, from our point of view and from, from the project's point of view, was the views of trust of the students. Because don't forget, you've got biometric data here. We've had a lot of upset, of course, with Cambridge Analytica and what people do with your data. <laughs> so why would you trust a system? And what's interesting is that those who were used, more used to working online, because in Bulgaria, they weren't used to working in this way. So the Open University of the Netherlands and in Barcelona and Catalonia and ourselves are more, more, more used to working with online systems. So there the students had more trust. And those where they didn't use much online weren't so trusting in the system. And students from those countries were less aware of academic malpractice than we are. And that's important because if you're going to use a trust system, um, an authentication system, if they aren't aware of malpractice, then that's going to become very problematic. And they, you know, some students said, well, what are you doing here? Are you just spying on me? And, you know, they have a history of coming from an area that was very restricted, you know, in their political um, arena. So another system, so we've got to be thinking about, right, uh, do we authenticate? We become, you know, more using more e-assessment. How do we authenticate? How do we um, convince students that this is a good way to move forward. And remember, one of the first slides was the tension between reliability and validity and the sorts of work we want to do. So I now want to move on to um, drivers for disruption. Who are they? Who do I think they are? I'm sure in the discussion you're going to tell me who they are, but I'm just putting a few uh, ideas together. So we've got commercial companies who want to move things forward in a certain way, not necessarily with a pedagogical view about how they want to move things forward. We've got private online learning institutions, and we've got government policies as well for shorter courses now, but more importantly, you know, something like the TEF, because they want to use metrics they've already got, they don't want to spend lots of money, you know, as I said before, one of our problems is showing what we know to be valuable and to actually indicate that it's learning. And in fact, Bart Rientes runs a, you know, ran a project about learning gains. I was part of that, showing how do we actually show learning gain. And the TEF is all about showing learning gain. And also, what about the students themselves? They've got know-how and they've got expectations. And, you know, they are a potential disruptor and a real disruptor because they vote with their feet. They disappear from us. They can go somewhere else. And what about GDPR? You know, the systems have got to be GDPR compliant. And uh, we've got an expert on AI and ethics here today. We've got Wayne here. And we've got to think about the ethics. Now, artificial intelligence is moving forward especially in business. And uh, we were working here with Azure, looking at what we could do with that. Um, you know, I think Dixon's Cami is a really good example. It's opening a dialogue for car sales. And what about Carnival Maritime Tracks? It predicts the water use to keep a cruise ship in working order. And there are thousands and thousands of passengers on these really large cruise ships. But also, what about AI for medicine? You know, at Harefield Hospital, they do use robots in part of the microsurgery. So th th there's all that going on. And, you know, AI for education, there's lots going on in that area. I mean, chatbots recommender systems, you know, could be used easily here. Um, I believe we are looking at that with the core systems replacement. But how about using this little robot here called Now. 
He actually lives in the computer science department. And what about assessment feedback from your own personal robot? It would be possible to link, and we've tried to do this now, to Open Essayist. So he could be a front end to the feedback, but it would be embodied feedback. And uh, how does he sound? How does he look? Let me try this. Hi, Professor Whitelock. I have reviewed the students' draft essays using Open Essays. Tom, Dick, and Harry require further feedback. I will arrange a date to talk with them. I think an explanation of the visualizations will help them to improve their essays. I will then check for progress. Speak soon. Now, we just talk a bit fast. <laughs> Maybe he talks like some of the tutors. But what would it mean, you know, to have some embodied feedback? Would it make a difference? And that's why we asked you to complete uh, those surveys that you've got here today to help us with our research in that area. But look at this. I think this is rather funny, thanks to Ali. You know, the robot seminars. I've only got five minutes left, but I can take just three million questions. Is that where we're going? Is that what's going to happen? But you've probably got lots of ideas that would help us moving our research forward. So if you've got some ideas, please, you know, hashtag Denise W and let us know what you see in your crystal ball. Thank you. So I think the floor is open to questions. Thanks, Denise. That was a lovely talk. Um, there are lots of things I'm sure we'll pick up from it, but the thing that struck me most was um, the connection between the emotional reaction to uh, feedback. Uh, I empathised with the story of your student. The first uh, journal paper that I ever submitted came back with comments and I put it in a drawer and I, I was devastated and I didn't understand that you improved things according to the comments you got. I literally put it away. I was very embarrassed and it took me a while to get my courage up for my second one. So I, I'm very interested in the emotional aspects, but I was very interested when also when you were looking at the cat, you know, categorization of how a tutor had done in terms of the styles of comment. And the thing that jumped out to me from your uh, screenshot was use of the word assessment of the tutor. And that gave me a, a little shiver, and I thought, no, we should really realise how, uh, how the affective parts of assessment are so important. Because if I'm reacting, oh, you wouldn't want to say you've assessed a tutor, whatever else you would do, you wouldn't introduce that as an assessment of them. And it made me, it made me really question the emotional reactions that we create uh, in our students by little things that we wouldn't even particularly oh, thanks, notice. Thanks for picking that up, Eileen, because I put that in there as deliberately. Oh. Because, you see, I wanted to see if there was a reaction. Because any time you say to someone you are being assessed, it, brings a t it does bring that strong reaction. So it's how we need to be working in partnership to support one another, to get the growth mindset that this is here to help you do better. Um, and I think in some ways, we're really good at this in the OU as teams. Because when we're in uh, production, we do work in teams. We do um, you know, give feedback to one another, quite critical feedback, but constructive feedback. And I think that's what about it should be. It should say feedback, not assessment. Thank you, Eileen. Well done. You've got the prize. <laughs> There's no prize solution at all. <laughs> Uh, 
Thanks, Denise. Uh, just to pick up um, a question in my mind is, is why would you be interested in having a robot in, in this? And is it something to do with the emotional part of it? Um, and particularly, I was thinking... We don't, we, don't, we don't know, because, you see, the thing is, there is a lot of, um, you know, research in it about embodiment. And also, um, there is a, an empathy, and we do anthropomorphize. So, an interesting question is, does it make a difference? Well, I was wondering what, what bits of being a robot you thought might make a difference. Uh, and particularly, is it the speech as opposed to written? Is it the fact that the thing is waving its arms around? Is it the facial expression? We don't know. That's why it's open. I think it's, some, it's a question to, worth exploring because we right. don't know. But it could be any of those. Okay. But tell me what you think. It, give us a punt. What do you think would be the weighted variable? <laughs> um, I'm, I'm yeah, just I'm, interested to know. It's, uh, I'm not sure. I, um, I was interested in, in the speech angle versus the, the written thing, whether it's something to do with informality or something that might make it feel different. What um, I thought might be... Um, interesting would be to explore if the robot, the, this speech, this persona helped you with the hints. Would that make a difference? Would you ignore hints that was on, on the screen? But we don't know. That's why it's so interesting. I have another interesting test case, which is uh, non-human yeah. robots, sort of animal-like ones. This yeah. is something that looks like a, a bunny rabbit. So yeah. would I be happy getting my TMA feedback from a, a cute little bunny rabbit? Or maybe you could choose. I don't know. But it's really interesting, isn't it? Um, on the question of what sort of animal it should be, um, I think okay. you could actually send some useful cues to the student about what level of feedback they should expect, because it's not going to be human-level feedback. Um, I, think, I think you should be thinking K-9 out of Doctor Who, for anyone who's old enough to remember <laughs> that. Because probably what the AI will give you feedback on effectively is some very basic stuff, but you can deal with that. And then when, by the time you submit to your tutor, a lot of the basics have been taken care of, and what the tutor is looking at is much more technically competent, so then they can engage with you as a much higher level. Yeah. And I'm not just saying this. I, I have experience of this sort of setup. I'm, I work in IT. I do software development. And when you submit a code change to the Moodle open source project, it immediately gets checked by a robot called Cybot, um, which has a little icon that is a little robot dog. And it will point out the kind of tedious syntax errors and you've forgotten to document this. It's clearly very mundane stuff. And it's, but it's easy mistakes to make. And like spell checker in Word, because it's just coming from this automated system that you know only does a few stupid checks, it's completely non-judgmental. And then you fix it. There's no, because it's artificial and you know it's mm. a fairly stupid robot, it's... There's no affect. You just know. You just fix this stuff. And then mm. by the time it gets to a human to review, you know, they can just concentrate on the important stuff. So yeah. I can see it being very effective there. You know, AI, it's not really that intelligent, but it can do some basic stuff, and it can do some basic useful stuff. So get it to do that. Make sure you pitch it at that level with an appropriately, you know, don't try and make it look like a human, make it look like a dog. And then, mm. then I think it'd be very powerful. Thank you very much. Perhaps I should have answered woof, not thank you very much. Uh, hi, Denise. I'm Roxana. I'm from um, the assessment area in East Campus. And um, I was really interested um, to uh, understand how much work was involved in getting the information into open SIS, uh, getting positive results from H817. Um, there wasn't a lot of work at all. We did it ourselves as tutors because I was the module chair and we did it, we did it inside. 
and we also had a researcher. So it wasn't a lot of work, but we had to manually do it. Would it be feasible for all modules um, to be able to do that? Well, we could automate it. Right. There would be a way of doing that. Thank you. Um, I've got hundreds of questions, but I'll, I'll try and limit myself. One of them I was interested in was in relation to the Open Essays tool of how you deal with disciplinary differences because essays are very different beasts in different disciplines. Ah, well, you see, it doesn't know anything about what you're writing. But what it does know, if you are writing a coherent story and how you will put the pieces... So it's training you to write an essay in any discipline but it only works in English. But essays are not the same thing in different disciplines, not, not just to do with the content, the construction, no, the voice are all different. Sure, but a good essay in any discipline will tell a coherent story. There will be a coherent narrative, and there will be some, even a report has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and, in, and it will deal with reports as well, the middle bit is the evidence, the bit that you really want to deal with. And it works across different disciplines. I know it sounds odd, we didn't expect it to, but it actually will. But it won't, it won't um, you see, a good essay, or good TMA, or if, it, if it's a written piece, will produce the best evidence, will have more of what's needed in there to give you the marks. I know it sounds strange, but the, 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 the diagram, the rainbow diagrams, do help you see that. But it needs a human marker, of course it does. The, the other bit, which is probably just a, a thought rather than a question, is, is how you deal with the, the interpersonal and the identity issues between assessors and students if we're using an AI. I mean, is it just that you're not focusing on areas of assessment where that matters, or...? Um, well, all these pieces here are formative assessment with the student doing something that is non-judgmental. And then usually what happens, people know a bit more and then they go to their tutors because they can do the easy stuff. But the thing here is you can practice, what the student said is you can practice and I don't have to reveal that practice or my failures to my tutor because my tutor gives me the mark. It's, um, there is this emotional <laughs> area, isn't it? You know, do you feel confident enough to reveal your errors? Whereas if I'm writing a journal article now, I send it to people and I don't mind what they say because I'm, sa I'm saying to, to, to people I admire who are scholars, tell me, you know, point out all the mistakes because you will help me get better. So it comes back to gross mindsets as well, I think, and fixed mindsets. Thank you. I won't hog any more time. <laughs> Thank you, Denise. That was excellent. Um, I, I think we touched, uh, and, and you touched in your, um, in your talk on the personalization of feedback. Because when we talk about the robot, um, it's something that some people might be happy uh, getting feedback from a robot, others might not. Uh, and I think it would also depend on um, how familiar they were with this uh, uh, robot in the first place, whether it was something that they interacted with on a daily basis uh, in their lives. Um, so then it might be an acceptable tool, whereas if someone comes along and plonks something on your desk, you might not uh, be so accepting of it. So there are lots of different um, variables, I think, involved. Uh, but I like the way that in your presentation you showed different forms of feedback, some of it visual, um, some of it uh, in, in verbal form. And it made me reflect on the fact that I think um, in schools, we are not, or children are not really used to getting a lot of feedback feedback, uh, they get a mark uh, rather than feedback. So then um, in, in uh, further higher education, there's an expectation that there will be, there will be feedback. And, and I think some of the emotional responses, because you're not used to it, uh, and because you have no choice in how you get it. Mm. Um, so you don't, um, you don't have a say in how it's delivered to you. 
Um, and then also I was thinking about the robot and how it might have different voices. So you might, mm. you might choose to listen to feedback and you might choose maybe the voice that it's um, delivered in. Of course, we're not there yet because as we saw with the robot, you couldn't really understand what that robot was saying. I know, it talks um, too fast, but too that was important and, and for you so to hear that yeah. too. This is the state of the art of where it is. That's right, minute, that's right. So looking else in to, to the future, I yeah. think um, there will be more choice, uh, there will be more personalization, and um, so I can see a positive future uh, emerging from all this. Thank you, Thank Agnes. You. But there's lots of questions we just don't know the answers to. Not yet, no. No. <laughs> Jean. Thanks, Denise. Absolutely fascinating. Um, and what strikes me about all of the, the comments that are coming from the floor is that this is all about relationship. It's, it's all about that interactivity and how, how the student, the learner, is interacting with something or someone which of course is the is the bedrock of, of the teaching and learning experience anyway but it, it 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 struck me that the questions about what what animal would it be or what voice would it be that there's something here about that our our I'm, I'm coming from a social psychology mm. point of view and, and the particular view that, that I bring to how we are in the world is that our different technologies around us shape us into being particular kinds of people with particular kinds of aptitudes and abilities and interests. And this will change our aptitudes and abilities and interests. It will change the way that the take for grantedness. But, but at the back of it, there is something about how we relate. Because I was thinking about the voice. When, uh, when we first got sat-navs, you could choose the voice that you wanted your sat-nav to give you instructions in. So that was one of the first things that, that people were doing with their sat-nav, was pick the voice. When people are taking selfies, we see filters applied, so they turn themselves into one animal or another, or an emoji where they'll pick one animal or another. And what it makes me think is just how much implicit sense of the relational, the, the me to this, this person or this thing, how much that is just woven through every m tiny aspect of this and how much we don't know, how exciting it is. Um, and, and I know that you're completely aware of this, but I think for people who are not familiar with this area, the temptation to think it can't, it won't, it doesn't know, and where we would be in 10 years' time or 20 years' time um, in the way that we have changed as people when it comes to interacting with a thing. Sorry, that was a little bit garbled and, and not a question at all. No, but but thank you, because these are all things that we've got to sort of investigate and think about. But I think underlying all this, because um, all this work has been with formative, you know, giving feedback in a formative situation is, I think underneath all this and some question we've got to really come to terms with is what sort of artefacts can we produce for discussion with our students to help them move forward that can become, you know, it's, it's a visualisation of maybe of what you've done or it's some speech or whatever to move forward. But if a lot of work can be done with unintelligent agents where the student doesn't feel threatened in any way and then they can move forward to then feel more confident to discuss the more important things with their tutor. I think that's the important point, but thank you. And we're actually at time. So before you all go, I have a notice for you. There will be another seminar on the 12th of March at 2 o'clock. It will be with Liz Ellis and Alice Gallagher, and it's called Student Learning Behaviour. And I hope you'll all be there then. Thank you very much indeed.